Hey everyone, just a quick note before we start. Due to the holiday in the U.S. and various other reasons, Michael and I recorded this on Wednesday instead of on the usual Thursday. And of course, after we wrapped, David Marcus of Calibra published a blog post answering some questions. Michael and I obviously did not get to discuss this blog post, but this podcast is still a meaty conversation. We talk about the letter to Facebook from the House of Representatives Financial Services Committee, plus we draw on Michael's experience covering global economic affairs at the Wall Street Journal. But I just wanted to explain why we didn't cover David Marcus's post. I still link to it in the show notes. Otherwise, enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unconfirmed, the podcast that reveals how the marquee names in crypto are reacting to the week's top headlines and gets the inside scoop on what they see on the horizon. I'm your host, Laura Shin. As you know, we've been doing a survey here at Unchained and Unconfirmed. I've gotten a ton of good feedback and lots of great suggestions on who to have on the show, like the recommendation that I interview Satoshi. I'll be sure to get on that right away. If you still haven't taken the survey, let us know your thoughts and how we could do better. Go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019 to give us your thoughts on what you like about the show, what we could do better, and who you'd like to see as a guest. The URL again is surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019. Also, don't forget, those who answer the survey can enter to win one of five free Casa Bitcoin Lightning Notes, plus a free year of Casa's Gold Membership including a multi-sig security app for iPhone and Android, a Trezor hardware wallet, a Casa Faraday bag, and 24-7 support. Those of you interested in learning more about Casa or about protecting your Bitcoin investment generally should check out my interview with CEO Jeremy Welch. Thank you to Casa for donating. Again, go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchanged survey 2019 to give us your thoughts and enter to win. Cypher Trace cutting edge cryptocurrency intelligence powers anti money laundering, blockchain analytics, and threat intel. Leading exchanges, virtual currency businesses, banks, and regulators themselves use Cypher Trace to comply with regulation and to monitor compliance. Today's guest is Michael Casey, chairman of the advisory board at Coindesk and CEO of Streambed Media. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me back. Facebook's proposed Libra is being seen as a threat to a lot of fiat currencies and could be especially destabilizing for countries with weaker currencies. You covered global financial and economic affairs at the Wall Street Journal, where you worked for almost two decades. Plus, I know you have personal experience living in countries with weak economies. So I was interested to get your take on Libra, especially now with the letter this week from the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Financial Services to Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, and the head of Calibra, David Marcus. But before we get to that particular news, can you just tell me what your initial reaction was when you learned about Libra? Well, um, you know, obviously we've been anticipating it for a while, so so it was um, you know something uh, of an anticipated response. But I think you know I was pleasantly surprised um, at I think the lengths that they'd gone to to try as best they could within the confines of what is obviously a corporate mission and a you know permissioned structure to ring fence the Libra project from Facebook itself. Um, which made it it maybe kind of conflicted because, you know, I'm on record as being extremely critical of Facebook. I have a very, very dark view of the company and its impact on society. So I'm very nervous about the role that it could play um, in, in this. But I, I feel like the structure of it is, is actually potentially if they can live up to it, lots of ifs and caveats in there, um, you know, quite quite potentially constructive to both cryptocurrencies but just more importantly because the one thing that really matters is you know financial inclusion and reducing global friction in in uh in money flows so um you know it i was somewhat pleasantly surprised but i'm inherently cautious given again the genesis that this has come from and as you know a number of governments and financial regulators had pretty much uh, the opposite reaction, uh, like pretty negative um, reactions that were fairly immediate as well to Libra. So why do you think that is? Well, I wouldn't say they're entirely the opposite to mine either, though, right? Because I think it's it's the it's inevitable that your response is going to be, 
you know, oh my goodness, this is Facebook, right? The company behind Cambridge Analytica, or not behind it, but the comp- company that essentially enabled Cambridge Analytica, the company that has built an algorithm that um, essentially has undermined our democracy by, uh, you know, building echo chambers in service of its own advertisers that steers views away from creditors and brands and the, and the people who really do make content in this world. I think it's, you know, it's inevitable to feel negative about this given the data breaches and everything else. So um, uh, uh, their reaction was is, is somewhat understandable. But I think the biggest problem that they face is that they're probably, you know, regulators don't understand the nuances here. And <clears throat> I would want to see a norm, I would see, I want to see regulatory effort made around holding Facebook to its word that it, it it live up to the structure of Libra and the spirit of it as being this external, uh, you know, open source model and that whatever fears rightly or wrongly exist around Facebook's capacity to extract data from users um, is, you know, doesn't come to bear because of, of that structure rather than, uh, you know, what could be actually be the worst of both worlds where they just focus as, as regulators often do on these money laundering risks and the sort of the, the broad, uh, you know, concerns they might have about deregulated money and therefore bake into the solution a model that essentially just reinforces the corporate control and the gatekeeping roles of these participants, of these members. You know, you, you could just imagine regulators focusing on the wrong concerns and essentially in the process, um, you know, building regulatory capture into the system because many respects the capacity to build, you know, innovative permissionless systems is, is often undermined by excessive regulation and compliance because that just becomes too costly for the little guys to deal with. So, you know, we could have them overreact and just make things worse in terms of, the risk of there being a corporate monopolistic gatekeeping role here, or they could play a constructive role in in, in really ensuring that this is truly, you know, as, as close to decentralized as is, as is possible under the current permission system and that there is no way, in fact, that any of the members, Facebook or any of them, can, uh, you know, control the process and extract data from individuals and so forth. That would be, that would be a good outcome. Um, I'm just not convinced that, that these legislators understand the problem. And that's what worries me. Well, so now let's talk about this letter that Maxine Waters, the chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee and other members of Congress sent to Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg and David Marcus. One of the statements that I wanted to pull out here was they said that Libra and Calibra, which is the wallet that Facebook intends to roll out, would quote, or could quote, lend themselves to an entirely new global financial system that is based out of Switzerland and intended intended to rival US monetary policy and the dollar. Do you think that's overblown? Or do you think that that is a possibility? <laughs> I would say that that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the dominance of the dollar is a massive problem in the global economy. Like it, it creates so many distortions and it's, and I've written a book about this some time ago. I mean, it's like, unfortunately, yes, what happens is that, 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 that every sovereign nation will fight for what it regards as its interests. But I, I, I think that, um, uh, uh, this model, right, which is essentially and ironically, um, Something that, that that John Maynard Keynes said that uh, all, that there should have been a global system of money built on when he just, you know he came up with the model for Bretton Woods and he lost out because the U.S. had the upper hand and they made the dollar the centerpiece of the global financial architecture. But Keynes's model was a basket of currencies uh, that he called the Bancor. Um, and, and here it is, ironically, Facebook essentially build Facebook and its partners. Let's be clear. It's 27 other partners building a system that is, it's not based on one particular currency. It's a basket. And I think that's a good thing because it's less volatile for, for countries who get exposed to big sweeping exchange rate changes and for all of the distortions that happen in terms of correspondent banking and everything else. I mean, way too much power in in New York Bank's hands precisely because the dollar has to be the intermediary. So I'm 
passionate about this, and I think that is barking up the wrong tree, but it's supposed the way that any regulator is going to say it. I also think that, you know, that, that there's allusions there to the concern about a financial system uh, and, and what they often, you know, allude to. I think that letter, in fact, had the words in there, a too big to fail system. That's a complete distortion of what too big to fail is. Too big to fail is a direct outcome of reserve banking, of, of, of fractional reserve banking. I mean, it is the very fact that banks, in, it's 2008, right? We're talking about the financial crisis and there were multiple uh, hops of counterparties facing counterparties facing counterparties and there was an absolute lack of visibility to the to the credit exposures of all of these institutions and the risk of, a, of essentially a massive global bank run that would come from that because you know these banks are not fully reserved that's the nature of banking it has fractional reserves so that would be that's what too big to fail is is that is that you know you have to prop up these banks because the systemic risk of all those intermediated credit connections builds a potential disaster now this isn't the case unless they think that and it's easy to regulate this this is focus on the one thing that this is supposed to be which is a fully reserved model now it's a little complicated because it's a basket not a one-to-one relationship but that's a mathematical thing and there's a very various ways in which that can be adjusted for it has to be heavily regulated it must absolutely be audited and compliant and transparent but it doesn't create the same systemic risks as the current banking systems. There might be other systemic risks for sure, because if this just becomes a, a, a go-to global payments rail, but that's what Visa is, right? <laughs> you know, that's what Mastercard is, right? What's the the difference? This is just a payment rail. Payment rails, we payment rails should become a commodity, right? We shouldn't. There shouldn't be money to be made from payments. It should be free, and 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 that's that's what potentially Libra offers, especially if Libra just is. It, you know, enables a lot more competition on top of either it or other other platforms. So I find that line of inquiry frustratingly uh, misleading and and misguided. It it, it misses the da- misses the whole point, really. All right. Well, there will be some people that will make money from these payment rails, but we're gonna. So we're just gonna take a quick well, break. Just, but, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's do this in a moment. So, and we're also at that point. I I want to ask you a little bit more about like Facebook's goal of financial inclusion. But first, a quick word from our fabulous sponsors. Will the world follow France and advocate banning privacy coins? Will government-backed stable coins become the new fiat? Are distributed and peer-to-peer exchanges just a flash in the pan? The answer is maybe. Virtual currencies can flourish and create a new, private, and more versatile economy. But that grand vision can't happen without keeping crypto clean. And that requires support of governments and accountability for bad actors. Privacy-enhanced compliance using cryptographic controls has the potential to preserve anonymity without compromising legitimate investigations. CypherTrace is working on this vision of the future. Sign up to stay up to date on the Privacy-Enhanced Compliance Initiative and receive authoritative crypto AML reports quarterly www.cyphertrace.com slash keep crypto clean. Hey everyone, don't forget Unchained is doing a survey. And if you give us your feedback, you can be entered to win some pretty awesome prizes. We want to know, how do you think we can make the show better? How would you like to see Unchained expand? Please take a moment and go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash Unchained Survey 2019. That's surveymonkey.com slash r slash Unchained Survey 2019. It won't take long, I swear. And when we get all your feedback, Unchained will be even better than before. What more could you want than that? Okay, okay, there is something more you could want. You could maybe want to win some of the prizes we're giving out to survey respondents. You could be one of the five lucky people to win a free Casa Bitcoin Lightning Node, plus a free year of Casa's Gold membership, including a multi-sig security app for iPhone and Android, a Trezor hardware wallet, a Casa Faraday bag, and 24-7 support. Those of you interested in learning more about Casa or about protecting your Bitcoin investment generally should check out my interview with CEO Jeremy Welch. Thank you to Casa for donating. Again, the URL is surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained survey 2019. Go there now to give us your thoughts on the future direction of Unchained and enter the giveaway. Back to my conversation with Michael Casey. So what did you want to say there about 
because, you know, as I mentioned, the validators, they're going to be making quite, uh, at least your your previous publication, the Wall Street Journal estimated that uh, it could be quite profitable for them to be running nodes. So it's not like, you know, this is literally a community effort, you know? No, no, I don't think that we should be deluded to believe that this is is, is nothing but a profit making business. But um, you know that the, it's it's a classic reserve management model, from what I gather. Right, it, that, that there is a um, the ten million dollars that you put up front essentially, you know, uh, backstops uh, funds that come in, and as as tokens get. Um, uh, uh, the tokens get issued in well, return I think it's for the those reserve, dollars. right? Right, you're running the reserve on, yeah. on the back of that, and you can make money of that. That's a standard model. All reserve models are built on that. Um, you know, that, that you could uh, legislate that they can't, but that's you know that 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 that's the that's actually interestingly you know kind of a legacy of the financial system itself that allows you to do that. That there's that there's uh, a benefit that one hands over to whoever's providing that service um in, in return for you getting you know a liquid cash payment system but we all do that with our checking accounts i mean of course we get a small amount of interest on our checking accounts maybe they could be mandated that they have to pay some level of interest back to to the token holders I, I'm, I'm not sure but it's just it's really not much different from everything that we have where yeah you know, no it is Venmo actually quite ironic and- that yeah. yeah. What's ironic is that what makes this work is the fractional reserve banking system. <laughs> well, a, a, yeah, um, as as the source of income for them, right? I mean, right, or, 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 right. But then again, you know, holding it all in a, in a cash deposit is one way. Of course, there's also T bills and everything. So then I mean, you could you could legislate that and dictate that they can't. That there's only certain places they can hold it. In fact, that that's more right. or less what will happen. I would think. Well, so there's two kind of takes that you've had, I think, on regulation of Libra. And one is, oh, like, you know, I hope that they don't kind of stymie the development of this. This could be a really good outcome for certain, especially the unbanked. But then, you know, on the other hand, you said, oh, well, you know, they definitely need to regulate it for these reasons. So like, in your world, if you if you were in the position of the regulator, uh, how, how do you how would you proceed? Well, obviously, I mean, uh, yeah, so to be clear, um, hopefully that doesn't sound too contradictory. I just think that it's smart regulation, right? So I don't think that it should be uh, regulated uh, in, in the context of a too big to fail systemic risk problem um, and and the uh, some sort of threat to, to the dollar. I don't even know what laws you would have to uh, build to, to uh, challenge that. Um, and I and I certainly don't think that um, you know you should build uh, custody requirements and so forth that might make it really expensive for other innovators to build on top of this. So so those are the things I wouldn't do. Um, I, you know, I'd look at all of the, the bit license problems that came up in in terms of how that killed off innovation, and be very careful about that because if you you know if you want to avoid these big companies from becoming monopolistic, then uh, don't don't put too big burdens on innovators who would compete with them. Um, but what I uh, do think they should regulate is um, you know is is reserve management, right? So they obviously you know there's strict rules on on uh, on auditing transparency. On um, on what they can do with the reserves, right? That 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 to me is fundamental to the the broader idea of risk within this, and 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 that that's a key part of it. Um, and and data, um, and and trying to uh, build in privacy connection protections in this, and actually being sort of pro privacy. Of course, that runs counter often to the AML and KYC demands that the banking system currently has. But I think this is a this is the kind of moment for a very smart conversation about what is what are our priorities and um, when it comes to you know banking the unbanked or or you know financial inclusion or however we want to call it uh, resolving the challenge of how we uh, identify under the uh, you know the, the anachronistic current models that we have people in countries that just do not have reliable state IDs and, and, and systems for checking on that, figuring out how to do that in a way that just actually enables them to be included, 
uh, d- that you know doesn't um, burden them. That that to me is a, is a great opportunity right now with this. That regulators could speak, could start to think intelligently about you know using some of this technology to uh, manage and assess risks on a broad basis, but not sort of build this very um, excessive personalized KYC model for for people who simply can't live up to those standards. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think the way that the FATF is going, the Financial Action Task Force, with its travel rule for crypto, it doesn't look like that's necessarily something that's going to open up. But I do think that this is something that that the that Facebook and its partners at Libra could be quite constructive in. They could have a very constructive conversation with regulators about sort of a smart, leaner approach to KYC AML. Um, that that doesn't say you know shut down Somalia entirely just because you can't figure out who the the guy on the other end of the line is. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to know what that would look like on the ground. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you about. So let's just get past the regulation issues for a second. Um, if Libra were to succeed, uh, kind of as you described it, as this basket of currencies that kind of, uh, I guess, remove some of the dollar hegemony and um, just, you know, actually was really widely adopted to the point of helping to bank the unbanked, then what do you think, what kind of impact do you think that would have? Like, what would we see kind of in developing economies where there are a lot of unbanked people? Um, And also, frankly, how would that affect those governments? So both on the ground, you know, on the ground impact as well as that Kind of, so this, the second uh, part of that yeah, question is really, really important because it will come down to whether or not in those governments they, they take a smart regulatory stance on this or not and, and, and what their priorities are. Um, first of all, uh, I, I, I share or, I, or at least to say I appreciate some of the cynicism around um, the, the view that, that this is really all about financial inclusion and not just about, you know, making a bunch of companies rich. Uh, I think that's an okay and, and healthy skepticism that we see. Um, I, I think that, that however, um, anything that reduces the cost of um, value transfers in global money flows um, that, that sort of, you know, does a run around of the distortive, you know, correspondent banking system uh will have benefits broadly for global inclusion. It'll just make accessing and onboarding cheaper and easier. So I, I, I think that we need to look upon the prospect of financial inclusion within that broader perspective and not necessarily get too sort of rose-colored, glassy-eyed about um, about this all being about the poor. Um, that said, um, I obviously care deeply about it and want that to be something that any company working in this space works hard on. And it's good to see that there's a number of NGOs within the structure of Libra that that might be able to hold that to bear and might be able to put resources toward developers to focus on apps and the like that specifically help that kind of community. And that's a good thing. Uh, What's going to be interesting, like let's take India, for example, which is very skeptical of cryptocurrencies, right? And has its own approach to solving financial inclusion. It has its own very centralized um, identity system, ADAR, which has come to a lot of criticism for the hacking risks associated with it and the sort of centralization of, of bio data that comes in that, um, and is, you know, a proud, uh, large uh, economy uh, that, 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 that I suppose likes to have its own currency. Um, there's going to be a challenge, no doubt, to the idea that it's for its people might prefer uh, a non-rupee based currency that's more stable than than the rupee itself, um, and and that that might be seen as as a risk to their to their current structure. Um, I just, I suppose, hope. I, I, I think there needs to be a really rich um, conversation about how the payoffs from having at least the payment system. Uh, as it, or at least the global payment system reside in something outside of the rupee is actually really beneficial to Indians as a whole, to the Indian economy as a whole. And on that basis, the, it's a pretty, it's a decent compromise to give up some of the sovereignty over that aspect of it. Am I confident that an in India or, or any other country for that matter is going to willingly do that? 
I, not not always. I think some countries are going to be much more broad minded about it than others. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what Venezuela's new whoever it is takes over from Maduro and creates <laughs> something realistic would say to this kind of model because they would recognise the absolute harm that having your own sovereign currency that's badly managed has done to the welfare of their people. Um, so Argentina willingly yeah. put, put itself under a currency peg a few years ago and it wasn't necessarily the best choice, but there was an acknowledgement there that the only way to, to, for the country to grow was to uh, essentially handcuff itself away from having monetary policy. So these are tough questions, but a, a realistic assessment of what's in it for your country and ultimately in the long run for your economy is what I'd love to see be part of the conversation here as you can tell i'm saying love to hope to you know (laughs) i'm not necessarily all that confident but these are the this is interesting for the sake of just raising the conversation having you know all of this is going to be really interesting and and hopefully it, it brings us to a point where we can truly discuss these things like the strength of the dollar and how that's a huge burden to developing countries like india who are beholden to the to the you know the the monetary policy of the United States, and just like whether or not those same developing countries might want to uh, defer to a more basket like structure for the simple reasons that the the payment that the, the people can have a more stable form of payments for international money, uh, those are oh, the sort of things that could be on on the table for conversation, and at least it's the discussions now potentially going to continue. Wow, so you you're kind of implying there that. Um, governments might actually also prefer something like Libra, a basket of currencies. Is that where that, that, we're that's what I was saying before? In the sense that, like, huh. if if you if your own and again, you won't. You've got to look at it. I mean, the, the cynical way in which many people in the crypto sort of the libertarian sort of crypto look upon government is that they are nothing but an entirely selfish entity that is driven around power of printing its own money. And part of that is true, and and that is that is a concern. But there is such a thing as an honest government that says, "I want to do what's best for my people." And um, if in the if I can see how giving up on that that you know, engine of, of, of bureaucratic control that is the printing press, I actually benefit from uh, unlocking f- payment flows, then, then that's, that, that's a perfectly reasonable decision for them to make. Um, mm. it, it, right. Some will make it. And, you, and you've mm. seen countries through history, as I said, Argentina did. I mean, you know, they, they didn't make the best choice, but there's, there's a willingness to give up on that where it benefits the population, where your long-term economic growth is, is built upon it. So I'm not as cynical to, to believe that, that owning the printing presses is something that governments will never give up. And I think this is an opportunity to have that conversation now. And, and that's what I'm hoping comes out of this. All right. Well, we will see where this goes. Thanks so much for coming on Unconfirmed. It was a pleasure, Laura. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about the topics we discussed, be sure to check out the links in the show notes of your podcast player. If you haven't yet taken the Unchained survey or entered to win a free CASA node, do so now. This is the last week. Go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash Unchained Survey 2019. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Factual Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Nuss, and Rich Struffolino. Thanks for listening.